Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're recording on Alberta Election Day as Alberta tries to figure out a new leader. And of course, the Calgary Flames have a new leader. And that's what we're here to talk about today. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt coming to you from uh, the nice weather of June. Matt, there's still hockey being played, but not Flames hockey. How are you doing so far this this spring? Well, it's uh, been nice to see the Florida Panthers uh, annihilate everybody out of the blue. Where was this Um, Matthew Kachuk when we needed him? Well, and that's part of the reason why with uh, everything that's happened on the Flames end that I'm quite happy that things are changing because, you know, you squandered two really dynamite players for nothing, frankly. Uh, where you know, you could have Sam Bennett and Matthew Kachuk leading this team instead of Florida, and we, but instead, you know, they opted to choose to prioritize other players instead of the important young guys. And well, that's not what we're yeah. here for today. We're here to talk about some of the change for the Flames and what a crazy off season it's been. And it's not even the draft yet. Like we've had so much going on here. I think our best bet is to sort of take this through chronologically. Oh, for sure. So, um, early in, uh, I guess shortly after the season ended, it was announced that, uh, Brad Trelivian would be moving on as general manager from the Flames. I think the wording that was used was that they were, Mutually parting ways, which really doesn't make sense because his contract was coming up for renewal. But uh, Brad Treliving, no longer the GM of the Calgary Flames, his contract is up at the end of June, and at that point, um, he he could have either signed a renewal or not, and we know he's not going to. Don Maloney, who's been in the organization for a while, for those that don't know, Brad Treliving came to the Flames as after being an assistant general manager in Phoenix. And Brad and uh, Don Maloney was the GM there, so sort of a mentor for him. Named president of hockey operations, and the last guy to hold that role was Brian Burke. Um, some of the, I guess, the room. Well, first, let's start with this. Were you surprised when it was said that Brad Trilliven was moving on? No, not at all. I I was pretty sure it'd be the coach or the GM. I just wasn't expecting it to be the GM. I, I figured that after how everything has gone of late over the last couple of seasons where the Flames have drastically underperformed um, throughout like the last five, six years even, and then all of the turmoil and drama that was last off season, and then this how this season the team fell on its face, you know, that if ever a team was needing a whole scale wipe out of the front office and changing of the guard entirely, uh, this was one of them. And one of the stories that came out at the time, and we'll talk more about the coach a little bit later, but one of the stories that came out at the time was that um, the GM pretty much maybe gave, we can call an ultimatum to ownership saying, hey, it's either Daryl or me. I don't want to go in another season with Daryl, who we know was not his coach, right? I mean, he had Jeff Ward in place, and it was weird because the Flames were in a good position and fired Jeff Ward, which you rarely see. Um, You were very happy with that, but I think we knew that there was some turmoil between the coach and GM this year. So I was really surprised to see that there was this argument between the coach and GM. It's believed that he said, you know, either the coach or the GM, they fired the GM and then fired the coach anyways. Yeah, well, it's one of those where, with how Daryl has been this season... Yeah, it was another evidently like he needed to go uh, based on all of the statements that have come out about him. From but I the, would have thought they would have done in the opposite order. It's fired the, the coach and then tried to retain the GM. Well, I think that the, it was just a matter of uh, house cleaning, so to speak, That because uh, the Maloney conducted interviews with all the players afterwards and he basically universally had everybody say, you know, we do not want to play under Daryl or you can trade us. You know, that was the general sentiment. So, you know, it's at that point where you have to go, well, if, yeah, you know, and not and from what I understand, not just players. They talked to assistant coaches and people all up the organization and did a very thorough internal review. Yeah, and. Well, how would you say Daryl's 
decision making throughout the season was extremely questionable. questionable. And you know, you and I on the show several times had discussed just for Christmas. We, we and, wondered if it was time to move yeah. on. And it, like those things didn't abate at any point in the season, and all the problems remained the same pretty much right till the end. So going into this, when we know when we knew that Brad Treliving was fired, um, or I guess moving on, we knew that the Flames had two strong internal candidates. They had Craig Conroy. They had Brad Pascal. Chris Snow, as much as he's a great guy and useful to the organization, would not be in contention for that just because of his medical uh, stuff. I would believe, but. Um, did you think that the eventual GM would be one of those two, or did you think it'd be someone from outside? Uh, frankly, I thought it was Conroy's right from, you know, as soon as Trilloving was moving on, I'm like, if you look around the league, there's not a ton of guys that are, you know, like you have your standard guys that just move around from job to job, and you know exactly what you're going to get, and... You know, like, say, like, if you hire a guy like Brian Burke, you know exactly what team you're going to get with Bar Burke as the general manager. And none of those that are available seem to be the correct fit. And so having a guy that's a new GM with a new mindset uh, that certainly Conroy has, like, that, to me, I think would be the most appealing way, especially... If the Flames do need to retool or rebuild uh, in the next couple of seasons, that, you know, if the team does go on a downward spiral, you can kind of, you know, hoist it on Conroy, <laughs> unfairly or fairly, and then go get a legit GM with, like, a, a track record if you're needing that at that point. But I, I have I no think too issue with Connie There's at been all. a trend lately of sort of former players becoming GMs. I mean, we look at guys, you know, I'd say the last generation of GMs that were usually lawyers or, you know, guys that didn't play the game. But we look at some of, the, you know, the GMs right now, Daniel Briere, Mike Greer, Pat Verbeek, Chris Drury. Like, there seems to be this trend right now of, players becoming GMs and Conroy fits into that. I also think if you didn't name Conroy GM, you would have lost. Oh, him. for sure. Like there's a few GM jobs open right now. And Conroy has been around the league for so long. I think that if not in Calgary, uh, Anaheim's looking for GM Columbus uh, or sorry, that's head coaches. Um, you know, there's a few teams looking for GMs as well, but I think that there'd be, uh, you know, Toronto right now, um, Pittsburgh, I think you might see one or two more. I think by mid next season, you would have ended up losing Conroy if you didn't promote. I agree, and like he's starting to get more of a pedigree as a a very known quantity as an executive person. So it makes sense that you know, and it's to go along with that. It's the same kind of story that we're going to see with Mitch Love. Uh, like, if the Flames don't hire him as the head coach, then I don't think he'll be a part of the organization anymore because of his su success with the Wranglers over the last couple seasons. That, uh, you know, if he isn't the head coach, I, I think that other teams would be champing at the bit to sign him. So Don Maloney interviewed 35 uh, people and which became eight multi-hour Zoom calls and then four finalists for the job. And on April 20, or I guess, sorry, that would probably be, yeah, May 23rd, my bad. May 23rd, uh, it was announced Conroy is the general manager and Dave Notice is the assistant general manager. And I really like this move. I think I think that the Bradshaw Living hire worked because they had the senior leadership of Brian Burke at the time. You know, taking a guy who'd never been GM and giving him that senior leader to go with him. And while the current title for Dave Nonis is AGM, there's a guy who's you know been a GM in two big Canadian markets, knows what that's like. Uh, Maloney has some experience there too as president of Hockey House, but I like surrounding Conroy with um, with experienced managers. And like you said, this is a guy who in Craig Conroy knows this organization, knows the players, knows why these players are brought in and what you know the thinking was. And I think isn't going to just start things all over again. He has some of that legacy thinking, but will do things differently. So I'm really happy with both hires of Conroy and Nonis. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting question for you. Do you think that this time next year, Don Maloney is still president of Hockey Ops? I'll tell you why I'm asking that. 
I don't know that he's the best guy for that job. I think he was the best guy they had internally at the time when Brad left and a guy who hasn't been as involved with the team the last couple of years. So he kind of came in as that impartial third party. If you look at the titles that were handed out to the G- the AGMs, they were all given vice president titles, but Nonis was given a senior VP title. I think by this time next year, Dave Nonis gets promoted to president of hockey ops. I would have to agree, but it's also one of those where I think it it's hard to tell, really. But uh, I think Maloney. I think he's kind the, of being brought in and groomed to take over Maloney. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's going to be like one season for Maloney or two or three. But I think you're along that right line of thinking of Nonis possibly taking over afterwards. I don't think it'll be more than one. I don't think Maloney leaves the Flames. I think he'll go back doing whatever it was he was doing before, but uh, scouting or whatever they had him working on. But I think that um, I don't think he lasts more than a season. I just think if you're looking at these guys, really, Nonis has the better pedigree of the two. I mean, Don Maloney's a nice guy, but where has he managed? A very non successful Arizona Coyotes organization. Yeah. Wasn't uh, he with the New York Rangers at one point, too? Yeah, but he wasn't their GM. Uh. I think he was the AGM there. So, you know, I just, I think that if you're looking at those guys, they notice as the pedigree, and I think you're bringing them in, getting them under Conroy. I think that becomes an interesting dynamic, too, to sort of have them answer to Conroy and then have them supersede Conroy. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's my guess. By this time next year, Dave Nonis becomes our president of Hockey Ops. Brad Pascal, a very, I would say, good candidate in his own right, still with the organization. I don't think there's that same need to promote or lose. I think Pascal will stay with the Flames for a bit because he's also the Wranglers GM and he's been doing a great job there. And I think, you know, he's, I think because he has that, um, I guess that extra role, I have to imagine that he's probably a little happier to stay here and keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, and he's learning on the job as well. So, he, you know, he yeah. could be a future GM candidate for another team or whatever. Yeah, you might lose him down the road, but I don't think he, I just don't think he'll be at the top of the list for any teams looking this offseason. Like I think Conroy might have. Yeah. And then we've heard some rumblings of uh, Flame alumni and uh, I guess Hall of Famer Jerome McGinla becoming part of the front office. Conroy said that's not happening now, but again, I could see that if, say, Nonis gets promoted to uh, president of Hockey Ops, I could see Jerome coming in as an AVP. Yeah, same here. And, and an AGM. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things where Figgy wants to do something. I'm sure that Conroy's going to be like, oh, no, please don't come work with me. Now, like- do you think that Iggy would be better? I mean, right now, Iggy's coaching in um, in Kelowna, and because he has that coaching background, I'm thinking if I'm going to bring him in, I'd rather bring him in as assistant coach than assistant GM. I think, you know, he's already showing some coach pedigree there. Yeah, I agree. But I think any way you can get him involved with the organization is going to be good. Yeah, I agree. So after the uh, promotion from within, and there were a lot of names that were on the list of potential guys to bring in. Um, you know, anyone that's been listening to the media has heard some of them. Um, you know, everyone from Jason Botterill, um, Matthew, um, Matthew Darchi out of Tampa Bay, L- Lawrence Gilman, who's been around for a while, Ray Whitney, tons of guys here. I think that it's good the Flames got their guy locked up early because yeah. I think especially with Toronto's job opening up, I have to imagine that some of those free agents who maybe you're talking to might have said, well, that's a more desirable job over there. So I'm glad that Calgary got their guy lined up early. And I think the benefit of Conroy in that case, too, is Conroy already has some idea of what the Flames' strengths are, weaknesses are, etc. as we go into the draft. He's not having to learn all that in three weeks. True. And you, you can just kind of pick up the baton and run with it at this point. Yeah. Exactly. He knows kind of where they're going, what the plan was, why certain decisions were made in the past. Even though he's going to do things differently, he has some idea of what the history of these decisions were. Some interesting uh, quotes I thought I'd give you here from the press conference that we can talk about when Conroy is announced as GM. Uh, The first one, Conroy said, we're going to make some changes to the core. I think we're going to add some youth in the lineup. And this one you and I have talked about for a while, Matt. I think... 
Brad Treliving's default has always been to fill spots with older guys. And we even saw that with bringing Corey Franz into camp and Sonny Milano to camp and, you know, guys like that. I have to imagine, and you and I talked about this at the end of the season, I have to imagine that if there's a hole on the roster, Conroy's going to leave that open for one of the HL guys to take. It doesn't mean they're going to take it. He's And he kind of hinted, too, he will go and find a veteran if he needs to. But I think right now you have to err in terms of opening up those spots for somebody to hopefully take. Well, and you see, like, this has been a long-standing problem with the Flames. And you look at, you know, like, guys like Yusuf Valimaki and uh, Sam Bennett and Matthew Kachuk and, you know, the lack of willingness to let players learn on the job. Like, I remember, like, when TJ Brody first came into the NHL and the first season, he was a disaster on the ice. But he played uh, in his rookie year, and he made the mistakes. But then the next year, he figured it out and has been a top-pairing defenseman ever since. And the Flames have never allowed guys like Valimaki, like Sam Bennett, like Matthew Kachuk to properly get the ice time and opportunities that they deserve and should get based off their pedigree. And now, you know, like, Valimaki is a top-pairing defenseman on the Coyotes. And, you know, Bennett and Kachuk are leading the Coy- uh, the Panthers to the Stanley Cup Finals. And, you know, it just, frankly, extremely poor asset management by the Flames over the last, well, the, the whole true living run. Um, you know, and it's hard what, to create a team that has sustainability if you're not allowing guys like Matthew Phillips and Jacob Peltier to play in the NHL. Yeah. I mean, we saw the emergence of Walker Dewar this year and you know, that was, I think the success story of the year and all the guys you mentioned who become top, you know, core guys, those are important too, but you also need to be developing your bottom six and your bottom pair D and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, even if they're not those high, Lineup spots. I mean, I'm looking at the lineup from last year. Even if you were to open up the Trevor Lewis spot or, you know, the Richie spot, like those kind of bottom six spots, you, you've still got guys on the farm, whether the top guys or even guys that I think project to be a, a bottom six guy. Like, I mean, if we look at the farm, um, you know, maybe they want to give a shot to a Dryden Hunt or um, Emilio Pedersen or guys like that. I think you've got to start opening those spots up and I'm glad Conroy sees Well, that. you look at Adam Rajitska for a prime example of this. At the start of the year, he was given a, a top six role and was playing rather efficiently in that top six role, had one bad game and then was dispatched to the third and then the fourth line and then out of the lineup for months on end. And it's like, well, yeah, he had a bad game. But, you know, if you're going to torpedo the guy and not allow him, you know, and then he's basically regressed after that point into the his old patterns of inconsistent play because it's like, well, if I make a mistake, I'm going to be sitting down again for who knows how long. And, you know, instead of, well, that mistake happened, reset new game you know and having the confidence that you're gonna have more than one opportunity to make an impression and you know or like Matthew Phillips with the five minutes that he played in two games which give me a break you could throw Jerome McGinley out there in his prime for five minutes on two nights and he's not gonna do jack all well, it's funny you mentioned Matthew Phillips. This is a guy I've been thinking about recently. I think you and I were both pretty sure going into this offseason that Matthew Phillips would probably not be back. He's a guy who I think is ready for an NHL Shot. role. Yeah. And I don't think he was going to get that going into next season if we had the same uh, coach in place. So now that they're, you know, and he's a Calgary guy. I think he came back for a year, just my hunch to play with the Wranglers to get that sort of ability to play at home and all those sort of great things. But now that the, you know, the flames are committing to that. If you're Craig Conner and you're calling Phillips and his agent, 
Do you think that there's more likelihood that Phillips might take one more flyer on the Flames and say, okay, well, if you say you're opening those positions, I'll stick around? Well, I and I, I would have to say that from, you know, like if I'm putting the, the, my Matthew Phillips hat on, you know, I would be asking for a guaranteed spot provided I don't torpedo myself in training camp to at least start the season in the NHL and then you know if I stay up or not that's you know on me but you know give me an actual shot and you know if he and I would be demanding that of Calgary you know because it's one of those there are 31 other teams where you're going to be given a shot you you had you basically came close to tying the AHL record for most uh, game-winning goals in a season. You had over 40 goals in the AHL. You're going to get an opportunity in the NHL from somebody. And And I don't know that he's in a position he can make those kind of demands, but what I could see, though, is saying, okay, I'm going to go to camp, I'm going to try my hardest, and if I don't make it, I'm pretty sure someone will claim me on waivers. Yeah. Because he is waiver eligible this year. Yeah. So I think that might be his best bet is say, you know what? I want to make the team with Calgary. If he does, I'm willing to come back. I'm willing to sign a one year um, and see if I can do it. And I'm pretty sure that after this past season, if he's on waivers, he'll get claimed. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it's one of those where he will get an opportunity. It's, you know, you always see guys like Austin Zarnick getting opportunities and, you know, I'm hopeful that he'll be back because I think he does have the ability to be a top nine forward with this team. But, you know, the the team needs to actually give him a shot. And and for those that don't know, the waiver rules are if somebody claims him, they have to keep him on their NHL roster all season. And if they decide to send him down, Calgary get first right to take him back. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm him, I think because of that, there's less risk if you did want to give Calgary a try. I don't think Calgary's going to give you that kind of guarantee yet, especially after a guy like Walker Dewar kind of came out of nowhere and earned a roster spot last year. But I could see them. I could see him saying, "No, let's give him a shot." And I'm pretty sure if he doesn't work out, I'll find a home. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a good. You know, I I don't think the Flames are going to start moving a lot of veterans that they have under contract at this point for young players. But I think looking at young players as being the guys to fill out the roster and, you know, leaving those spots open if a young player can can slot in there, I think is the right method at this point. And Connor Rouse told us young players are cheap, right? Yeah. And if nothing else, it's, it's a cost-saving move when, like the Flames, you are going to be butting up against the cap next year. Oh, for sure. And, like, that's part of the reason why I think that as we're heading towards the draft that we might start seeing some trades by the Flames just to... Uh, you know, because uh, there are seven impending unrestricted free agents and the Flames can't really let any of them walk. So, well, let's discuss that as well. So after next season, after the 2024, 2025 season, the Flames have Michael Backlund, Elias Lindholm, Trevor Toffoli, Noah Hannafin, Chris Tanev, Nikita Zadorov, um, and I guess we can lump Gilbert in there too, though that's not really a big one. Um, and also... Yeah, those guys are all um, your, I guess, free agents. So Conroy said, and I'll read the quote here, we can't go into a season with seven UFAs. I know that we heard from some of those guys in the offseason that they, and Lindholm, if you listen to Lindholm Meg's interview, it sounded like he had no desire to sign here. I think Conroy's got to figure out now who's going to stay and who's going to go. And I don't know he can do that till he gets a coach. So in some ways this is going to be, you know, a longer process. But I think if, if those guys aren't going to sign, you've got to start moving at least one of them at the draft. Yeah. And I think that like, you're going to see like, say like with Elias Lindholm, because it seemed re readily apparent that he had zero interest in staying here that uh, you're going to look at trading him for futures at the draft just because, you know, that's what makes sense. And, you know, the Flames could get a first plus, uh, especially with Lynn Tolm's cheap contract. Like, there are plenty of teams, like, say, Detroit, where, like, they have the 10th overall draft pick. 
you know, like there are plenty of different teams that, you know, it makes sense for both sides. And, and, and I think that's a really interesting thing too. And I mean, we won't spend as much time today, maybe talking about some of the what ifs and trade, but we've heard at these press conferences lately, the flames not wanting to say rebuild. And we've heard Connor say he thinks they can go for it. If you're moving out Lindholm and getting all futures, I think that ability to go for it becomes a lot less when your top line center is gone. I think the Flames, if they're going to make that deal, have to balance, you know, a first round and getting a roster player, at least one, to to fill a, a top six spot. Because if you if you get rid of Lindholm, you've got what Backlund, Kadri, and Dubé. Lewis. If he comes back on your on your center depth, that's not going to work. No, and that, that's where you know having the ability to go after free agents or you know like do kind of sort of what uh chicago did or montreal did uh, where they traded roman off to the islanders for a draft pick and then traded the draft pick to the blackhawks for kirby dock yeah you know and, and like the flames certainly could do something along that line of moving the so to speak trouble player uh that we need to move get an asset and then flip it for a different player entirely yeah but in the end then i think that you've got to end up with more than just futures however you get there i think if they want to be competitive they need to be making sure they have nhl roster players because as great as we think coronado and peltier are going to be um i don't think that you you know slot coronado and peltier and do an elias lindholm spot and say all right we solved our problem no and uh, that's where you know you have to kind of go shopping for the a higher quality uh, young guy who might be on the outs with the team. Sort of like how uh, Washington traded Orloff and Hathaway for first, traded that first for Rasmus Sandin. Yeah. That's a good example, yeah. Like that, and the, those are the kind of moves that like the Flames have to look at, period. And the nice thing with all seven of these guys is they're on really team-friendly contracts. So I think the Flames can almost get a premium for any of them if they want to move them. Pretty much, Because of yeah. a great contract. Yeah, the only guy that I, the, well, two guys that I, I think will be here a long time are Tyler Toffoli and uh, Nikita Zadorov. I think those guys both get long-term extensions. So that's what I was going to ask you. So let's go through these. So Michael Backlund, do you think Backlund resigns? Uh, there have been reports of you know him basically wanting to be a captain or to move on. Uh, so. If the Flames decide to make him the captain, having him play the, out his career here, a okay. If he wants to move on, that's a okay too. And it's, he's thirty four. He'll be thirty five at the end of next season. I don't think you can really sign him for more than one or two years after that. But if I think if he says, "Hey, I want to move on and try to win a cup," if he doesn't think he can do it here, I think it becomes almost like the Jerome McGinley thing, and we've got to respect that. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of those where it's up to him. You know, if he wants to be the captain and that matters more and staying here matters more with the captaincy, then moving on, sure. It, th- this is one of those instances where Backlund's such a good player where whatever makes sense for him, you just go with it. Because, you know, if he wants to be here and the captain, sure. If he wants to move on, sure. Like, you know, he's not a bad player. He's the type of player that will age well, too. Uh, He basically reminds me of Yuri Lettinen with Dallas, Mm -hmm. where he was just good until he retired. And yeah. Elias Lindholm is currently 28. He has one year left. Do you think he'll be back? Zero chance. Really? You think so? Even if they switch coaches? Yep. Uh, What about Tyler Toffoli? I could see him staying for a few years. I think if the Flames lost Johnny and Kachuk, and then they lose Lindholm and Defoley, this organization is going to be laughing stock of the league. I think you've got to find a way to retain either Lindholm or Defoley. Yeah, and like I can understand, like it, it. How do you say? It depends on what you would get in trade. You know, like if you're turning, uh, say, Lindholm and Defoley into legit good young players that, you know you're basically rebuilding on the fly without rebuilding. Sure. But the likelihood you're going to be able to turn them both into that is not likely. I don't think. 
it it's still possible and like if the it d just depends on the return like a lot of people didn't think that losing a drone kachuk could get you what it it ended up doing technically just kachuk got us that i know well the cap space helped get Kadri, so okay um Noah Hannafin, do you think he'll be back <sighs> Yeah, I think if you're looking it, at a tradable asset, this might be the the best tradable asset that you could lose out of lineup this year and not notice a lot. If the Flames need to trade a defenseman, Hannafin is the best one to do so. And frankly, like the Flames could sign like this year's free agent version of Chris Tanev and not really skip a beat. You know, like and that's not to say that Hannafin's not a great player. He is. It's just that the Flames also do have a lot of high-quality defensemen. And, you know, like with Anderson, Uyghur, Tanev, Shillington, and Zadorov, like, you've got... And I think Stetcher will be back, too. Yeah. And, you know, like, you have a pretty successful group of young and older defensemen that, you know, if you wanted to make a trade and get another, like, say, a good forward prospect or young forward... The, you know, it makes sense. And, you know, the defensive depth is a major strength of this team. And if the Flames wanted to, say, sign a free agent or two uh, to compensate, like, it's doable. Uh, Hanif's, Han or sorry, Hannafin's only 26, so still a, a good young defenseman. Like you said, I think they've got a good back end now with Uyghur, Anderson, Tanev, Zadorov, Stetcher, Stone, um, I think that um, Shillington will be in there. So I think that this is a guy you could afford if you're looking for a piece to move that could net you, even if you just want to net futures. I think you could afford to trade him for futures, bring in a free agent if you need to there, and not see a whole lot of change on the back end. Yeah, because like if you got the free agent equivalent of Tanev, that swallowed 3-4 guy, which there are always a handful of them, you know, and even if you're signing that guy to the same contract that Hannafin currently is, that's perfectly viable at this point. Uh, what about Chris Tanev? Uh, Tanev, I would be happy having him back. You just kind of have to bake into the cake that he's going to miss 20 plus games every year. He's 33 right now. He'll be 34 the next season. I think if you bring him back, you're really at that point bringing him back as like a number seven role. Because you know he's not going to be able to play, you know, 40, 50 games a year. It, it would be more like a, a solid, like, two or three years at, like, three million type of thing where he's, like, yeah, the I, high I quality say, five, more six. than, like, two, five. Yeah, he's more like the high quality five, six guy who, who actually is, like, a top four defenseman, but because of all the injuries, less so. And then the last guy that we talked about is Nikita Zadorov. And I think we saw Nikita Zadorov take some big strides this year. I think that he will be a guy who will want to stay here. And we even kind of heard that in his exit interviews. And a guy that the Flames will try to retain. So I can't see. I think if you want to trade a defenseman, there's other defensemen you could move to get you better return than Zadorov. Yeah. Like, honestly, he is a guy who deserves like five years at five and a half. Like, he, you keep this kind of guy. It, he does everything well enough where, you know, he, he's a bit and of an odd player. he didn't make as many dumb moves this time, last season as yeah. he has before. Yeah, and, you know, he's the right age. He's 27, heading into 28. The defenseman, like, you, you look at uh, Zdeno Chara. I'm just going to use that as an example. He was a very mediocre defenseman when he was with the Islanders. He struggled a bit with Ottawa for a while. And then when he got to about 27, 28, he became the Zdeno Chara that everybody is familiar with in the Hall of Famer. And, you know, like we saw this last season, last two seasons, Zadorov taking those kind of steps. That's not to say that he's ever going to reach that height, but it's one of those where you know, like a six foot six guy that hits and can chip in 30 points. Like that's a hugely important thing for this team. And, you know, if he can play solid defense and manage to walk the line like that, you know, like that's perfect for what this team needs for the long term. For sure. Yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're, 
I don't know if I agree with the money, but I agree with the assessment of him. Yeah. I'm just basing it off of, you know, defensemen that are like that tend to get more just because they're weird. Um, and then the last thing that Conroy said is that we will absolutely have a captain next season. He said that there's no way that you go into a season without a captain. It seemed like he was kind of surprised there wasn't one already. So I guess with that in mind, from the current roster, who would you put that C on next season? If uh, he stays long-term, Michael Backlund, if not Rasmus Anderson. It's interesting you mentioned Anderson. I did a I did a podcast uh, last week with our buddies at Shifts and Pucks, and they were all saying Anderson too. I I agree with you. If if Backlund is here, I think Backlund becomes the captain at this point. Yeah. If not, I think you definitely look at Anderson for sure. Yeah, Anderson. He's just a very vocal guy, and he doesn't really care. Uh, with you know, he he's blunt and will speak his mind and you you need that as a captain where you know like if the team's having a problem with the coach or how things are being executed or the team's struggling and you need somebody to kick them in the butt you know like having a guy like anderson who does not pull punches is very much the right way to go yeah, and I, I think that Backlund, I mean, I wouldn't keep him here just because he wants to be president, but I think that there's, I think that he's shown that he can earn, that he's earned it. Yeah, oh, for sure. And that's where you have to kind of lend to where he's at. You know, like if he wants to stay, then you do whatever it's necessary to keep him. Because, you know, like he was had his best season this year, even though he's 34. And, mm-hmm. you know, and he's getting better every year. Like, he's just a very And, dynamic. I mean, he's 34, right? What's the likelihood this guy plays past 36? Like, I don't think it's that high. I think even if you give him the C for a couple of years, and then you, you sort of groom Anderson as the next guy, well, Anderson's um, still 26. Well, the thing is, is that guys like uh, Backlund, who are not, like, offensive dynamos, uh, you can even look at, like, the other... Uh, defensively oriented guys like Gonze Kopitar and uh, Patrice Bergeron, like they're they've aged well into the twilights of their career while still being like the elite defensive forwards that they are. And yeah, I mean Kopitar's thirty five. I don't know how long he's got left, but you know, like uh, Bergeron, I think he's thirty eight, thirty nine. Yeah, you know, and that's where, you know, like Backlund, I'm sure, could be effective, not necessarily as a, like, second, third line guy, more third, fourth line guy when he's 38, 39, but he should still be able to play at a reasonable clip through that, just because of the style of his game is not... And I could even see sort of what we saw with the Conroy Aguila thing, where Conroy is the captain, and he gave up the C for Jerome at some point. I could see the same... I could see the same thing happening here where, you know, you yeah. give back on the sea and you kind of tell, or so, yeah, you get back on the sea and you say, Michael, you're getting older. When it's time, you give the sea to the next guy. You know, I could see them doing that as well. Um, I like your choices. If, if you were to lose, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I would give it to Anderson yet. I think maybe after a year, but I think if not backland, I might even look at a guy like Kadri, just more your veteran guy on the team. Uh, I was actually going to go slightly different and say Huberto if it was uh, forward. Yeah, I could see that one. too. Uh, because it, how would you say, with all the bull, bull <laughs> that happened uh, this year with him and Sutter, you did not hear the man complain in public once. And, true. Yeah, and believe me, I, I'm sure that there was plenty of things that he could have went off on in public that were legitimate gripes with how Daryl used him and treated him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you didn't really hear anything from him all year. So, you know, and that takes a certain type of person to keep it in the room so to speak and so i could see that also being a feasibility and the only reason i can't see tanev is just because how much he's actually not in the lineup yeah 
I think he could be a great A, or if you want to do that, you do like dual captains. So when he's there, he can be a leader. And when he's not, well, you've got another captain. But when's the last time we saw dual captains in the NHL? It's been, I think the Flames might have been the one of the last teams to do it. Yeah, I think you just have uh, him as an A for yeah, that I agree. reason. Well, um, let's move on from the GM. The other one that we mentioned on May 1st, Daryl Sutter was let go as the Flames head coach. Um, Don Maloney said that he debriefed Daryl for two and a half hours at the end of the season, and they've now let him walk with about $4 million in his pocket. I wish I had a job that fired me and gave me $4 million on the way out. Daryl's now probably one of Alberta's richest ranchers, but we've got to find a head coach now. Yeah, uh, this is one of those where, like in the past, I've you know campaigned heavily for needing... Uh, a, a veteran guy to uh, lead the team, but frankly, this is one of those instances where I think having a younger guy who is competent uh, makes more sense and why I would be very much in favor of Mitch Love being the new coach. Are you comfortable with a rookie GM and rookie head coach? Yep. So there's three internal candidates. There's Mitch Love, who's the head coach of the uh, Calgary Wranglers. I just about, I caught myself there. I just about started saying Stockton, but I caught myself. The Calgary Wranglers. Um, by the time it becomes normal, they will move. I was gonna say, but I was just thinking that by the time that we start saying it, they'll be they'll be on to their next market. Yep. Um. So they. He's obviously done a great job with the team there. He's uh, he did a great job this season, last season. Uh, Ryan Huska, who's the Flames assistant coach right now, is another internal candidate. He's had a lot of success at lower levels. He was their AHL coach for a while. And then Kirk Muller, the associate coach, is apparently on uh, an internal candidate as well. And it's also been said that he's had some interviews for other coaching vacancies. Um, just get throwing some other names out there, Matt, that are in the mix so we can discuss them. Um, yeah. a- Andrew Brunette. Andrew Burnett's a former player. He was a coach in Florida when uh, Huberto and Weger were there. He was the coach um, for most of the year and let go when Lindy Ruff came in. Uh, still a young coach, but a guy who's got some experience. Um, we've got a whole bunch of assistants, Marco Strum, Jay Leach, um, guys like that who've been talked about. And then a, an interesting name I think that's come up is Gerard Gallant, who's a very seasoned coach, a guy that I really like as a coach. Um, he's come up from, I guess, you know, various teams we know him from. He was in Florida. He ha- he's been in the NHL. He was just most recently with the Rangers and got let go. I think those are probably your top coaches. It has been said the Flames have talked to Laviolette. Um, they've talked to some of the older guys. I think that there's a bit of a dance due here, very similar to the GM job. They talked to 35 guys for the GM job, and I think part of it's just you don't want some guy to get a GM job somewhere else and then hold a grudge against the Flames for not talking to him. And I think same thing with the coach. You want to talk to everybody and say you talk to everybody. So of all those names, your guy is Laviolette? No, Mitch Love. Or, sorry, Mitch Love. I have Laviolette's yeah. name on my screen. Um, I, I like Love. I just don't know if it's his time yet. Well, and that's the, you know, I look at, like, other teams that have been successful, and you look at John Cooper and uh, Bednar. From, Bednar, yep. And, you know, they basically were the exact same coaches that Mitch Love is with their team, where they, they had nothing but a ton of success with their farm teams, and they got promoted, and they took the ball and ran with it. And, uh... He seems to be a very extremely knowledgeable coach, and he gets the most out of his players, and the players like him and respect him. So, like, especially after the Daryl Sutter experience, where it seems that he was off the rails, uh, you know, having a coach that is very much a good communicator with the players and respects them as players... Uh, I think is very much more needed as a healing method uh, in addition to, like, that's why I don't think a guy like Gerard Gallant or Peter Laviolette, who are more or less the same type of guy as Sutter, 
are good ideas. I also uh, don't know the owners want to pay Daryl $4 million to go away and then also shell out for a top coach. I mean, you know, I've talked about this for a while. The ownership here has never seems wanted to put that money into paying for a high-end coach. Yeah, and it made sense at the time, and the Flames had a really good year, and then everything kind of went sideways after that. <laughs> I think that if they're going to promote from within, I think they would promote Ryan Huska. I think that Mitch Love... I think you do run the risk of losing him, but I don't also also know that you want to promote him just so you don't lose him. I think that Huska has had more time in the organization. He's been with them since 14-15 with Adirondack, where he was a head coach. He was a head coach at the WHL level. He has a lot more playoff experience at those levels, and I think that Conroy probably has more familiarity there. If it was Pascal that got the job, I think Mitch Love would definitely be the head coach. But what I could see is what they did with Huska, where they bring Huska as the head coach and then maybe Mitch Love as an assistant. Yeah, entirely possible. I want to throw out another name. Are you okay with that? Yeah, definitely. Todd Reardon. He's an assistant coach in the Pittsburgh Penguins. He's the yeah. only guy to have coached both Ovechkin and Crosby. Um, he was an assistant for Barry Trotz in Washington. So, you know, a very established coach there. While it didn't go as well as he hoped in his little bit of time in Washington, um, apparently still in good terms with Washington and with Trotz, he accepted a, a job with Pittsburgh where he runs a defense. And last summer he was promoted to an associate coach. So I think sort of a, a younger guy still, but a guy who's got some head coaching experience, a guy who's worked with some other coaches. I think that Reardon, if you want to look outside, could be one of those guys that isn't you know brand new to the NHL, but has some interesting pedigree there. Yeah, I agree. And same uh, thing with it, Joe Sacco, who's a Boston Bruins assistant coach. Yeah, there are plenty of different options that are in that same vein, which make a lot of sense. Uh, it, it's kind of one of those where, like, once the coaching staff gets announced, that it, it's more like, okay, yeah, I can see why you did that and chose that guy over that guy. It's just a little up in the air because... Most of the guys don't either have a ton of experience or you know exactly who you're getting. So it's hard to delineate until we actually have a exact on the who. For me, if they want to go with an experienced coach, I'd go with Gallant. Yeah. I don't like I don't want Laviolette. I think Gallant, if you want that sort of seasoned NHL coach, Gallant's the guy to go with. Uh I'd probably go Alan Vigno myself. But interesting okay yeah now here's an interesting question so right now the flames the blue jackets uh the rangers and the capitals and the ducks all have coaching vacancies if you're a top coach or a guy that's interviewed for many of those do you think that the flames are a choice destination or do you think that you know if you have the choice among many of those you would pick someone over the flames well pretty much us and columbus are at the bottom of the list frankly. You're saying you don't want to go coach in Columbus with their nobody roster? Well, that'd be fun. You know, like, oh, hey, I got to be an NHL head coach. I, I think <laughs> if I had the choice, and if I had the choice between Calgary and New York, I'd take New York. Yeah. Calgary and Washington, they, I'd take Washington. If I'm not a Canadian guy, I could see Calgary and Anaheim taking Anaheim. If you're an American, stay on that side of the border. Stay out of the Canadian markets, but I agree. Calgary and Columbus, you probably definitely have. I would say Calgary wins out there because I think they're yeah. closer to a cup. Yeah, and that would literally be the difference. And that like could the be the team. difference with Anaheim too. If you think that Calgary is closer to the cup, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean it. It's going to be fascinating to see how this one goes. I'm not sure I want a rookie coach and a rookie GM. Um. I don't mind. I can, under, I can understand why you think that. It's just, it, it's hard because of the fact that there's no, like, real, like, specific guy that's on the coaching market where you go, yeah, that guy really makes 1,000% sense. And I don't think there is for maybe f the fans who don't know everybody. I think the the hockey world is small, and there's a lot of the guys who are assistant coaches, like Jay Leach and some of these guys who I think are well-respected in the hockey community that I think might surprise you there. Like Ryan Huska, I doubt is known outside of our market. Mitch Love, I doubt is known outside of our market, right? So you got to find maybe that guy in another market to interview as well. But 
My my gut tells me if they promote from within, it's going to be Huska. Yeah. Right now, we'll see. I'm guessing... Okay, so my prediction is Ryan Huska becomes head coach. I think Kirk Muller gets hired away um, by somebody else. Because, I, honestly, I could see him being Columbus's new head coach. I could see that too. Yeah, I could see him going to Columbus. And then I think maybe you bring Mitch Love up as associate coach. Um that could definitely be a possibility there if you want him to sort of be your heir apparent to the head coach job down the road. Yeah. And then I think maybe next year you you look for Jerome McGinley to join that staff. Yeah. And like, I, I know that we've also heard that like the flames are interested in bringing Alex Tange and who's uh, assistant with Detroit. And I could very much see him being like an associate coach as well. I think optically you can't bring him in as the head coach. No. I think if you've got Conroy at the helm, you got Jelena here, you got Iggy, you got Tange. I mean, you know, yeah. who's next? Who else are we chilling in the dome with that season? Oliwa, where's Chris Simon? Get Kipper as the goalie coach. That's right. Like, you know, I just think optically you can't do that. And it's, it's tough to poach somebody's assistant. We'd have to wait until. Well, that's he, where I would suggest him basically being Kirk Muller to Daryl Sutter. Where is the associate that, yeah. coach? And, you know, I would kind of like to see them do something like they did with the GM job. Or if you're going to bring in a young guy like, um, I don't know, if, if you're going to bring in Huska or Love, maybe find a guy like. Kirk or like Andrew Burnett to be their associate coach, sort of like we saw Dave Nonis come in with the experience of the AGM. And I think maybe having a guy with a little more, I guess Tangay would work. He's been around the league, but I'd like to see maybe someone who's been a head coach, even if just an interim spot, take that role. Yep. A lot of fans are talking about Burnett and maybe we should talk about him because of that. I think the connection there is that he was a guy who was in Florida. He was the coach when Huberto was having his really good season is he someone you think the Flames should be taking a hard look no, at? No, not at all. I I think that he is largely overrated. Uh, like, yeah, the Panthers had a, the President's Trophy season there, but he basically took Quenville's playbook, copy-paste, and then when teams adjusted to that in the playoffs, the Panthers had no adjustment after that, and the Panthers quickly lost, and... You know, uh, I just, I don't see a, him being a good coach. And I think the results that he got were great. But I think that he's very much an assistant level coach and who kind of got... I'd have no problem on the st with him on the staff, even him being the associate coach. But I don't think that just because he's had one good year with Huberto doesn't mean that he should be the head coach. Yeah, well, you didn't see teams lining up last offseason to go and sign him. Which I think tells you something, right? Yeah. Other teams passed on him. That tells you something. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'd be fine if they want to bring him in as part of the staff. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the weird thing here is our staff is very much in place already. So if you're bringing in a coach like Mitch Love or Ryan Hoska, they probably don't have their guys. But I could see, you know, if you're going to sign someone long term, I could see a guy like Kale McLean moving on or, you know, some of these guys, maybe not this offseason, but over the next couple of seasons, sort of turning over that that coaching staff. Yeah, I agree. And I think if you don't bring in Huska, there's a good possibility you lose him as well. Like he's being looked at by a lot of people as a potential head coach. So I think between Love and Huska, sort of like with Conroy and um, Pascal, I think whichever one you don't promote, if you don't promote one, I think you're at risk of losing the other. Yeah. And you got to be okay with that. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You know, and and that's, I think there's something to be said that Calgary's creating such good coaching candidates that you've got to be okay with that. Yeah. And it, it always sucks. And, you know, you always wish them the best when they move on. And, you know. Is there anybody besides Burnett that you hope the Flames don't go with? Uh, Gerard Gallant. <laughs> I don't, what about Boudreaux? Well, yeah, him too. I I just uh, Gallant he does not seem flexible in his game plan, and you know he's not quick to adapt. And you know, especially in the postseason, you need to have flexibilities. And how would you say after Daryl and rigid thinking, I do not really like to see that combo anymore for a while and 
you know, like I, that's why I'm very much in the, I don't mind a younger coach who isn't afraid to shake things up. Yeah. I'm still going to stand by my outside prediction that I think Todd Reardon could be the surprise candidate, but I think in my heart of hearts, they promote from within. And I think just because Connor has more familiarity with them, it might be Huska. Yeah. And very well could be. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, if it was Huska, I'd be perfectly happy with that as well. He's a very good coach. And, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do. But, Matt, I think that brings us to the end of this episode. Uh, lots to talk about here. Obviously, the media has been talking about some of the speculation. And knowing our luck and the way things usually work, we're recording this on the 29th. They'll name the head coach tomorrow. That's the way the things usually work with us. Yeah, just like our last episode, we wrapped up. And, like, the next day, we're living got fired. And, and, you know, it's, yeah. Murphy's Law so with us. either way, who... Whether it's tomorrow or in the future, the next time we will broadcast uh, will be close to the draft, probably mid to late uh, June, where we will start talking about what we think the Flames should do, some of the player names that uh, fans should look for and maybe do some research on, and not only in the first round, but talking about their picks in two through seven as well and how we think the Flames might handle this draft. Yep. And we're going to. You're, you're the Todd Button of our show, so you're our head scout, so you'll be doing yeah, a lot of research between now and then. We'll be profiling basically everybody past Mitchikoff at number five uh, through pretty much the rest of the first round for our pick at 16, just to take a good look and see who makes the most sense for where the Flames pick and all that kind of stuff. And talk about the possibilities of trading up, trading yeah. down, all sorts of yeah. things. Yeah. And. More than likely, you're going to see a forward in this draft just because there happens to be a huge amount of forwards where we're picking, and uh, defensemen are kind of few and far between in the top end of this draft ranking. Well, let's save that for next show, and we'll leave that as a teaser for what we're going to talk about when we come back in June. So check our social media for uh, the next recording date. You can find us on Twitter, at Fireside Podcast. Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat, Instagram or Fireside Chat underscore podcast, and of course our website, firesidechat.ca. You'll find news there, and you can also subscribe to get our show when it comes out in your inbox uh, at firesidechat.ca. So, whatever's best for you, we hope you'll uh, stay tuned for the next episode, and we'll talk to everyone then. Yep, as always, go Flames, go, and go Panthers. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.